Good morning, viewers. I'm here in Milan at the IAC convention here. It's been a fantastic experience, even though I've only been here for a little over a day. And we are joined by our first interview. And you may recognize this gentleman from Skyrora, but would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Thank you, and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Derek Harris. I am the head of business for Skyrora, and I'm happy to be here again in this wonderful city of Milan in the IEC. Fantastic. Uh, well, once again, really appreciate your time. So, you know, the question that's, you know, we're just going to jump right into it here. I mean, I've been covering you guys for years, and uh, we want to know where are you in terms of Skyrora XL? I mean, where are we in terms of getting you guys to orbit? Well, I think, if I'm being honest, we're looking at sort of Q4 next year for our demonstrator launch. That may push into Q1 of the next year, uh, but basically everything's in play. So we're expecting to have our license hopefully by the end of the year, uh, and that opens up everything. So it then depends how the tests go, if there's any anomalies or such like that. But if everything goes great, we could be as quick as Q4 next year. Wow. Well, that's certainly something we're looking forward to. So um, tell us a little bit about your spaceport arrangements. Tell, me, tell us about how Saxavord um, was set up as your primary choice, um, how you guys are feeling about it in the aftermath of the RFA anomaly, that sort of thing. Um, where are you guys sitting right now with that? Yeah, I think... Uh when we first started to look for a spaceport, it was what was going to be convenient, what was going to be the best trajectory. So things like that was what we reviewed. We looked at Sutherland, of course. We looked at Saks of Ord and every other one that was available. For us, keeping everything in the same jurisdiction for legal purposes was why we went with a Scottish one over maybe Andoya or S-Range for what we've been doing. Uh, but to be honest with you, it comes down to Frank and Scott uh, up there, the personal relationship we have with them, the ability to sort of, if, if we have a question, we just text or phone each other. It's so much quicker. Uh, so I can't really thank them enough for that. It really makes life easier. In regards to what happened with RFA, uh, I think you saw our post that went out. We were very heartfelt towards them. Anyone that works four or five years to try and get up uh, the vehicle up there, and then to have an anomaly happen, it's always going to be heartbreaking uh, and it's a shame. But I know after a day or so of feeling bad, they would have dusted themselves off and got back up to it. And that's really what it's about. Uh, I hate the old line, space is hard. Uh, I, what I like to think of it is space being resilient. Uh, and that's what I expect to see from RFA. So in regards to uh, Skyrora XL, because a lot of viewers may not actually know what that is, number one, can you tell us about the rocket and its capabilities? Number two, what is it about your technology that sets you apart from the competition? Yeah, uh, well, the Skyrora XL is a three-stage vehicle. The first stage has nine 70 kilonewton engines on it. The second stage, a single 70 kilonewton. And the top has our small three and a half kilonewton. And that is one of the differentiators for us. So it is basically uh, an in-orbit delivery service. So it allows us to start and stop up there so we can deliver a constellation or we can do two or three different areas if we need to. Uh, so that's one of the things that stands out. The other I think would be our propellant mix of high test peroxide and uh, kerosene, but we use our own internal kerosene, which is called Ecosine. Uh, what is great about using both of these is the basically the temperature in Scotland and the weather conditions. If you're using cryogenics and have to shut down, there's a lot of more work that goes into it than having a vehicle filled with kerosene and peroxide because it can stay out there. It can stay there for three hours, three months, whatever needs to happen. So for launching from a Scottish environment, it's actually quite useful. Uh, but I think that's the thing, what we're seeing with all the European launchers is we're all looking at those differentiators fuel-wise to try and be that little bit more sustainable and to try and find ways. So we, we may not be at a zero carbon launch yet, but every company has something that they're doing to try and take that responsibility on board, which is great to see. Now, space sustainability is a huge thing with the UK Space Agency, which, of course, is one of your backers. What is Skyrora doing to help with that, to make sure that we are not adding significantly more to low Earth orbit than we already are? 
Yeah, well, I think the big thing that started off as well would have been the sustainable space uh, roadmap for Scotland. And that came through Optima and Astro Agency. And that basically brought all the companies together. So Skyrora, uh, Spire, Clyde Space, uh, Trade in Space, all the sort of space uh, people in Scotland. And they fed into it. They took experience out of funnily enough being Scotland the whisky sector and how to be a bit more sustainable and responsible and that was why the roadmap was developed and why what we're doing along with that is obviously taking part in that Uh, we're doing the easy things first as you would expect so trying to keep our supply chain down to zero carbon as near as possible Uh, you basically if you go in paperless office recycling all all of the easy things you would expect from whether it was a bank or a building society to uh, a rocket company Uh, but then when we're looking at the actual building of the vehicle we're looking how can we have less wastage where do we get the supplies from so if we're looking at 3d printing our engines like we are uh, there's a lot less metallic wastage than there would be if it was the old-fashioned processing. So things like that, and we're trying to build it in through design rather than sort of retrospectively do it. And so it's, it's coming along. So every every day there seems to be a slight thing that we can do better, and that then gets added into our uh, sustainability plans. Fantastic. So, um, so we we have the rocket. Obviously, um, you have sustainability plans. You it's a three stage rocket. Um, tell us a little bit about the that uh, sometimes called a kick stage. Although I think you guys call it a space tug. Can you give us a little bit more information on uh, that vehicle's capabilities? Yeah. So th- that will be carrying up to three hundred and fifteen kilograms of payloads for us. It has the ability to start and stop up to twenty times at the moment. Uh, so as I say, that's great for delivering constellations. But this is the very first stage of space tug, and what we're expecting to see is that to progress. So part of my role is to speak with other companies, and we're looking about how to use it more for an orbit servicing. Uh, it's got the ability uh, with robotic arms to be able to sort of latch on. So whether that's to do what we would call an MOT on a satellite. So for those that may not what know what MOT is it's it's what the UK does to cars to make sure they're still worthy of being on the road Uh, so this would be checking out basically the lifespan of satellites Uh, there could be ways to have it for working with companies to help refuel or deorbiting so there's a huge amount in the future that can be done with it that is going through R&D at the moment Uh, and it's very exciting to see what's happening with it and I know that there was announcements yesterday with deorbit with something similar Uh, so seeing all of these vehicles progress is uh, really exciting for the future. Now, do you have any collaborations to tell us about anything that you're doing in conjunction with perhaps some of the other folks who are here, um, customers, that sort of thing? Anything to announce in that regard? Uh, we're being very quiet on announcements at IEC. I think for us to come out at IEC, it needs to be something big. So we'd have to say this is the day we're launching. That, that would, that's the sort of respect this would need to get there. Uh, a couple of announcements that have been out in the past, so our in collaboration with Spirit Aerospace. Uh, We're working with our 3D printers to try and see if that can break into not just the space market, but actually the aeros market for that, seeing if they can 3D print propellers or parts for engines like we are actually doing in house. Uh, There's two or three things that are coming up in the future that I'm sure will be interesting. Uh, One that was recently out there was the working with Viasat for the in-range system that we were doing the testing on so hopefully there'll be other announcements in and around that in the near future uh, as well as uh, future launch dates so hopefully uh, the tail end of the year will have a few other details to spill for you Last question um, in regards to a, I read a statement does, right before we started this interview, and, and this is not something I was expecting to do, but I'm going to be asking every European citizen about the statement that was made by RFA lately about the state of uh, launch providers in Europe and the lack of support for them. What Do you have any reaction to that in regards to Skyrora's experience with your own support that you've been receiving for what you're trying to do? Yeah, I think trying to get investment for launchers is a very difficult game to play full stop. Uh, But I think what we're seeing is in America, you have the chance to fail and fail fast. 
And you can see that with the likes of um, Astra when they've been doing their projects. Uh, they've been allowed to develop, fail, develop, fail, de fail. I think the UK and Europe are a lot more reserved, so they expect to see some successes almost immediately, and that's why it's a little bit of a more reserved market. So it is a very difficult market to get the investors in there. There are some out there. Uh, there are some out there that will let you sort of push that limit, which is great. Uh, obviously, we, are found, uh, we were founded by one of them uh, for that purpose, who's allowed us to do a lot with R&D uh, and not expect full results. But I think their statement was a little bit correct. Uh, it was a little bit out there, but a little bit correct in regards to there does need to be a lot more funding into it to try and catch up with the US. Uh, you, I don't think you'll ever see... Uh, European launch in the near future sort of landing like SpaceX does. Uh, that takes a lot of development and a lot of sort of experience and a lot of money. Uh, however, I think we also have a different set of capabilities over here. We have a different mindset towards engineering as well. And I hope that can sort of counteract that a little bit. As I said, we've been quite frugal with how we spent our funding and still got quite far ahead. I know the, the other teams at RFA, ISAR and, and such have done the same. Uh, so. Money is a big differentiator, but I think if we use it wisely enough, it'll take us a while to catch up. But yeah, but I do think we can get there, but we do need some more investors that are maybe open to a bit more risk. Okay, I lied. I had one, actually one more question in relation to what you just said and something I've been wondering about a lot when we're talking about European launch providers. How in the world are you guys accomplishing what you do and the development that you're making, not just you, people like RFA and others, with so little money? I mean, we're talking tens of millions of euros here, not billions of euros. How do you do it? I think it comes down to the mentality of things. Uh, I can speak for the Scottish and obviously for ourselves. We have the, the mentality of having the UK way of doing things to try and find better and cheaper ways of doing it, making it easier, making it quicker. Lord knows if there's a process it takes five hours, let's figure a way to do it within two and get to the pub. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to lie on that one. But uh, there, there's so many things. So taking a look at what did help out with Rocket Lab and SpaceX at the beginning with the modular approach, the containers, you see that now with most of us. Uh, so th there's little things like that. And it's just saying, well, I think one of the biggest ones is you look at buying components in. If you buy space grade components, they, they could be 10, 15,000 a box for say nuts and bolts. But then when you look at the actual health and safety rating on them, they go through less requirements than the automotive, <laughs> which is 500 pound a box. Uh, so it's, it's looking at things like this, bringing in suppliers who actually do what it does and needs to do, but making them aware, actually, you're a space company now as well. You don't just do things for cars. Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing. And this is why, instead of being billions and billions, we've managed to keep it down to the millions that we have done so far. Well, it's been a great pleasure following you for the, all these years. Looking forward to you guys getting off the ground. Thank you so much for your time. Great to see you.